Welcome to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. He's talking to today's industry leaders and entrepreneurs about the people side of their business. Hello, Best Team listeners. My name is Kristen Calloway, and I help produce this show. And I'm stepping in for Adam Robinson one last time over this crazy holiday season. Today I'm here with Julie Rogers. She's the COO of Hireology, and we're going to discuss uh, hiring executives. Julie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kristen. Um, So at Hireology, we follow an operating system called the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Um, A fundamental part of this system is that there are two roles, a visionary role and an integrator role. EOS describes the roles as a visionary is often the person who conceived of the company, had the original idea, and continues to have ideas about how to expand the business. Um, Visionaries often focus on the big picture, client relationships, culture, and then the integrator is the person who thrives on creating order out of chaos. They are the person who naturally is suited to setting priorities, solving conflicts, removing obstacles, and getting the company from point A to point B. And that's you. Yes. And that means (laughs) that all departments except finance report to you. For the most part, yep. And um, that's a lot of departments at (laughs) Hierology. So I guess my first question is, um, would you mind taking us through um, how you got to this point and maybe a little bit about your current role? Sure, sure. So um, I didn't, you know, when I was uh, graduating college, I didn't say I wanted to be an integrator. I had no idea, obviously, what that term meant. Um, So how I got to where I am today I started off my career, so I graduated from the University of Michigan. They're, they have an undergrad business program. That's fantastic. I graduated I graduated with a degree in finance and accounting and um, started uh, as a forensic accountant with Deloitte mm-hmm. um, back in 2003. It was an interesting time um, in the accounting world. Uh, the, the legislation, Sarbanes-Axley, had just been passed, which... Um, the meat of that, there's tons, there's tons of regulations that came about with that legislation. But one of, um, w- one of the meatier parts was that accounting firms could no longer provide consulting services to their audit clients, hmm. meaning you couldn't impact the financial statements of your audit clients and then go and audit those financial statements. <laughs> See, you know, <laughs> now we think it's hilarious because, but you know, that's that's basically how Enron got into trouble. Anderson right. did a bunch of work for them and was their auditor, mm. so they were incentivized to maybe not see the things that they should have seen. So uh, long story short, I was in forensic accounting, um, and it sounds like a very sexy job. It was <laughs> terribly trite and horribly boring. I found my way into, uh, so it was big projects, one project at a time, long projects. I, um, I thrive um, in environments where there's changing priorities mm-hmm. and um, with multitasking. And so knowing that about myself and knowing that I wanted to uh, use, just do more analytical work, so be more mm-hmm. analytical in, in my output, I moved over to our valuation services group. So that, uh, that group at Deloitte, um, what they do is they help companies understand the value of their businesses or their intellectual property. And you do that for a couple of reasons. One, compliance reasons, because mm-hmm. SAT tells you you have to. Two, strategic purposes. You want to know how much your stuff is worth. So that was um, my role basically for nine years. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah spent, spent a ton of time um, here in Chicago and up in Minneapolis working with agribusiness and consumer product companies um, on those two, those two types of um, you know, reasons for, for valuation. Um, I love Deloitte. It Mm -hmm. is a fantastic place to launch your career. I learned everything I know about managing people and about operating in an office um, at Deloitte. Um, You know, as my old boss put it, though, I wanted to go from manager to partner. So, you know, I want to move really, really fast. And Deloitte just unfortunately doesn't. You know, they're a huge 150-year-old company. Um, Reasons they can't do that. They're an accounting firm, obviously. So I... uh, I found my way over to Groupon Mm -hmm. where um, my, my, if you asked me in uh, 2012 what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you a wine store owner. I love it. And uh, (laughs) uh, so I thought, hey, well, why don't I go work at Groupon? They serve local merchants Mm -hmm. and I'll figure out what it is to be a local merchant by serving them uh, through Groupon. And um, so, uh, you know, I began as a city manager, which was effectively a general manager for for five years. uh, geographies in the South. Everything mm-hmm. was organized geographically at, at Groupon in terms of sales. Um, and 80% of my job was making sure that our pipeline was full, that we were closing deals. And then the other 20% is like figuring out where we should be going after those deals and then how to place those deals on the site to drive the most subscriber engagement. Mm-hmm. That um, was really fun. It was a totally different challenge than I had ever experienced. 
Um, the, the people I managed were completely different than the people I'd managed at Deloitte. Managing salespeople at Groupon versus managing consultants coming out of B school is yeah. it's totally different uh, mindset. So it, it, it uh, I, I definitely um, had to learn a different way to manage and learn how to tap into different motivations, um, motivational types and communication styles. I, um, I had, a f- I wore a few different hats at Groupon. So I was in that sales role for, for about a year. Then, um, they made some shifts internally and I decided to move over to the uh, international operations team. So mm-hmm. Groupon had grown historically through acquisition. They bought up a bunch of companies, a, bun- a bunch of copycat Groupons over, yeah. the, over the course of their history and had never really integrated them. And so this, in 2013, they decided they would start integrating all of these companies, same platform, same technology, same Salesforce instance. And my job was to make sure that everyone that was a group on employee mm-hmm. um, had the same roles and responsibilities no matter what country they were in. Oh. So if you're an account manager in Indonesia or an mm-hmm. account manager in France, that meant the same thing. And, you know, when I started, it didn't. Yeah. Um, so my job was to go figure out what everyone does and then basically write the the roles and responsibilities handbook for everyone in the deal factory. So basically oh. how a phone number becomes a deal on the site. I published that uh, t- two days before I gave birth to my second child. Mm-hmm. Um, and then <laughs> came back uh, a short six weeks later and began um, was still on the international operations side. And I was launching um, the uh, Perpetual Inventory product internationally, which was really great. It's really fun to launch products. Um, but again, like I mentioned, I had a six week old at home going to Europe for extended periods of time wasn't um, ideal. Right. So I found my way back over on um, to the North America side of Groupon, managing much larger groups of salespeople. I was managing the East region, the Chicago region, as well as our training team. So mm-hmm. our, uh, the, the folks that we trained to become salespeople, as well as our warm lead team, the people that accepted phone calls, people wanting to work with Groupon. All in all, it was about 450 people um, at its height, which was um, which was a lot of people and just a, a huge team to manage. I had three desks, which was, wow. which was pretty fun. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, and... Uh, I, I love that role. It was it was just a lot. You know, Groupon has yeah. been going through some changes, and um, I decided I wanted to move. I wanted I wanted the best of both worlds. I wanted the best of Deloitte and the best of Groupon. I mm-hmm. wanted a fast moving company that was values driven, mm-hmm. and also was professional and knew where they were going and had a mission. And so I I did some soul searching and and looked in the market and mm-hmm. um, was looking at a few different opportunities here in Chicago. Found my way to a role called the VP of Customer Success at Hierology. Mm-hmm. I went through a um, probably five rounds of interviews. Um, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, I remember. If you've been through the hierology <laughs> process, you know that we are thorough in our process. Um, joined as a VP of customer success in February of 2015. Mm-hmm. So now I've been here almost three years. And it was an exciting time. We were um, we just closed the, the Series B back in August of um, 2014, which is probably directly why I was there. I had yes. some money to spend. Yes. Not that I'm that expensive. Um <laughs> And it was it was an interesting time, you know. We I think our bookings in 2014, um, you know, it, they were they were serious, but we were trying to double them in 2015 and right. then triple them in 2016. So we needed to make some moves in order to make sure that the business could do that in a way that wouldn't break the business. Right. So um, I uh, became very close with Adam. We realized we had a really good working relationship. We didn't yet know that he was a visionary and I was the integrator. Yes. But we knew each other's strengths, and he knew my strengths, and. Um, my strengths are with process and systems and making mm-hmm. sure that if we know where we want to go, that we can lay the, ro- the road that'll get us there. So I um, worked with Adam over the course of that year and gradually um, began to shed light on the need for internal operations mm-hmm. and we needed to build our infrastructure. Our systems needed to be integrated with each other. And um, through that, um, managed to uh, gain some more responsibility with sales. So I was overseeing mm-hmm. sales and then eventually also product and engineering. Mm-hmm. And then um, in 2016 was moved into basically a general manager role. So I was overseeing the entire P&L of the business with the exception of finance, as you mentioned, um, which is a role I haven't had at a company before, but I, I, I loved, um, you know, I really appreciate the ability to, to set a goal and make all the moves necessary to hit that goal. Mm-hmm. And having purview over each one of the departments and, and working with the leaders of the departments to make sure that we're all moving in the right direction. Um, it, that's my passion. Yeah. I come from a siloed environment and mm-hmm. that's I, I see silos as basically like if you want to if you want to ensure that um, you grow slow, make your make your company siloed. Um, and but, you know, silo comes from people like lack of confidence, protectionism, yeah. all that stuff. So um 
then in so we did some great things in 2016 and in 2017 at the beginning of 2017 adam promoted me to chief operating officer and that's where i have been since yes. um and we have grown significantly over 2017 we're now 135 people which is incredible i think when we joined we were maybe 70 or so so yeah, we doubled in that. size uh, we had our biggest hiring class this past monday which it's amazing was, yeah it's great it's really cool yeah and exciting times it is very exciting so uh, that brings us to now. And um, so you've hired uh, head of marketing, CS, finance, product, business development, biz ops, head of sales. <laughs> That's a lot of executives yeah. uh, for, <laughs> for one person yeah. to hire. So um, what were you looking for when you were hiring these people? Um, you know, one, we our core value. You have to exhibit our core values. Um, so we, you know, we have five core values here at Hierology: own the result, pathological optimism, eager to improve, create wild moments, and no assholes. Mm -hmm. And um, you can't. No one structures their resume showing <laughs> those those core values. <laughs> However, um, in the interviews that we conduct, you know, we do, like I mentioned, an extensive amount of interviewing. We want to make sure that we're getting at examples of you demonstrating those those moments where you have taken a project to completion to great results when it wasn't your responsibility or you've taken the opportunity to learn from someone or something that didn't go your way but you took it as that opportunity or you know frankly how you conduct yourself in the interview process tells me whether or not you're an asshole right. um so the, and the other thing the other thing that's really worked for us here at Hierology is as we've been growing you know it takes a lot it takes a lot of energy it takes a lot of work ethic and it takes a lot of um frankly just wide-eyedness mm -hmm. to to come and work here and what i find is with the with the executives that i've hired is most of them in fact all of them have not been in the role that they're in previously mm -hmm. so we have had really great success hiring people that have either been at a, a level or two below what we're hiring them into and they come in and they absolutely crush it. So I call it punching up. They're basically yeah. punching up their weight, um, you know, in boxing. They're, they're they're punching above their weight, and that is that is yielded extremely um, extremely positive results because not only do you have someone who has a ton of energy and really wants to prove themselves, you also have someone who's not unafraid to like roll up their sleeves and, and really do the work that they're prescribing. Um, and that's that's been that's been one of our little secrets. I love that punching up. So. Uh, What's a red flag for you in these interview processes? In the interview process, what's a red flag to me? Um, we're a bottoms up business. We run our we are in our business. We look at metrics day in and day out, and we that tells us that gives us a sense of where we are, what we're doing, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. If a red flag to me is when I ask you a question and you don't answer me directly, or I ask for an ex example of you know uh, quality that you you've demonstrated and the and the example is non-specific and when i push you for details you can't provide them mm -hmm. all of our executives all of our people here have an amazing command of details and of you know the facts that lead us to conclusions we are we are very logical business we we all um i think appreciate a good debate we love logical reasoning and therefore in order to exist in that environment you have to be great at analytical reasoning whether it's deductive or inductive reasoning so if you can't that to me is is a red flag um in in an interview process is the inability to succinctly express um, examples be a little bit shady about answering what i'm asking you or um not really have a command of the details that you you like you are listing as reasons that you've displayed a certain quality that makes sense um and currently you're trying to fill a gm role yeah so um we are so right now we have um we have we've historically focused on what we'll call two verticals that's automotive and franchise and other so mm -hmm. it's basically <laughs> auto and everything else mm -hmm. and um you know we have we have seen really great success with our content marketing so the funnels that we put out there and um small businesses owners response to that coming to us and saying hey i want to see hierology tell me what you're all about um, and these people aren't even on our radar from an outbound sales standpoint. So we begun to ask ourselves late last year, well, what if, what if they were on our radar? What if we were actively outreaching these to these people, um, not just from a content marketing standpoint, but from a sales standpoint and um, at their conferences and making sure that we were there 
when they were looking for a hiring solution. Those were the questions that we began to ask, and, and we think that, um, and we see a f- like a huge uh, amount of opportunity. You know, the amount of businesses there are between like 10 and 500 employees is, is the hundreds of thousands in the U.S. I mean, non, non-QSR based, non-quick service restaurant based. So um, why, why limit ourselves to just, you know, franchise businesses? We, we love our franchise customers, and we think that's, you know, franchise businesses are such an important part of the American economy, mm-hmm. but that doesn't... Um, that's not the whole American economy. You know, we have independently owned businesses all over the place that we want to make sure that they're able to build their best team too. So the reason to hire a GM is I can't spend all of my time focused on driving that business. Mm-hmm. And I need, I need a single owner, what I'm calling a general manager of the SMB business unit. This person's responsible for the sales, the post sales and the implementation of our product. And um, that's done not only through up on sales efforts, but creating partnerships with software, Mm -hmm. different software partners and making sure we have the right relationships with different demand aggregators. Uh, It's, it's a, it's a mile wide job and an inch deep. So you have to be able to know marketing sales, Mm -hmm. customer success. Uh, You have to know our product. You have to be able to talk engineering um, and, you know, to, to, to make sure that you're serving your needs. So that's, it's, it's a unique job. It's something that I think a lot of people look for that full P&L management. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens there. How's it going? Um, it's going pretty well. Uh, you know, there we've gotten we've gotten a fair amount of um, uh, outreach. It's it's funny, you know, job description or job titles really do matter. Yes. So I get a lot of retail general manager okay. applications. Um, so you know, I, I could probably hone my um, job title a little bit. Um, but yeah, there's we've had a few really great referrals. Mm-hmm. So I think we'll start interviews then next week. That's that, exciting. Yeah, I, I am very excited. Th- I think that this is going to be, I'm really excited to see what, what happens with this business unit this year. And um, some of these roles, I'm looking at them. I've been here as long as Julie has, and I remember um, the hiring process for all of them. Um, which one was the most difficult? Which one was the most difficult? Um, I think, honestly, probably finding, um, I think, the CFO position mm-hmm. was the most, and so it was a VP of finance position at the time. Uh, it was difficult because uh, Adam and I had to balance what w- was going on at the office mm-hmm. and with the ne- the need for this for this role and finding someone who again had not yet done the full finance ownership, mm-hmm. but was willing to, uh, but but was hungry and 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 wanted to to punch up. And had also um, been through a equity equity financing round, mm-hmm. or like a, a raise. We knew we were going to have to raise in about a year from that time. And um, there's just you know there's not a ton there's not a ton of companies in Chicago that have been through that or yeah. at, at that time had been through that. So finding that finance talent was 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 pretty hard. And it was funny. It was I actually Peter Didas, who's our CFO. He came from Groupon, and he and I had briefly worked together at Groupon. Um, briefly, briefly. And, uh, you know, Adam came to me and said, you know, do you know this Peter guy? And I was like, I think I do. And I don't think I like him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we had some run in about commissions at Groupon, but he was on the finance chair. I was on the sales chair. They, they never get along. Yeah. Um, but, you know, little did I know Peter would be the, um, the yin to my yang when it comes to <laughs> all of the to not letting me spend f- foolishly on all the things I want to buy. I love it. That's great. Um, which quality is the most important for the leaders that you're hiring? Are you going to limit me to one? As many as you'd like. Oh, great. Um, I Curiosity. You got to be curious. You, you can't think you're like the sun and the moon rise and fall with your opinions or the, your point of view. Um, we are all curious human beings at this company. We, can, we are all proven wrong daily. Let, it, let us work together to, to find the right answer and to drop defenses and, and be curious. Um, two, you... Frankly, you got to be sharp. You got to be smart. We move really fast. Um, you, you have to understand how quickly we move, why decisions are made, why you are a part of that. You have to present your case. And, you know, Kristen knows this from having sit, sat in on these meetings. There, you know, the, yeah. there's, there's um, y- you have to be able to hold your own at the table. Um, so it's both intelligence and confidence, frankly. Um, and then, uh, you know, the core values. You have to exhibit the core values. Um, you have to, you have to take accountability, take ownership, be willing to be wrong. You have to be willing to just also like put it all out there. You can't be an ass <laughs> <laughs> and you got to find, you get solution oriented. Like yeah. I, I have 
Don't ever bring me a problem. I can point at problems from a million miles away. Bring me four, four solutions to choose from. Four, maybe three. I'll do three. <laughs> but, you know, be solution oriented. What? How can we make the best of this situation? You know, it's yeah. not blissful ignorance. It's, it's a way to find the, the way out. Because if we're all doomsday, it's just like no one's ever going to get out of that situation. Right. What qualities can be taught and which cannot? What qualities can be taught, which cannot? I think um, of the qualities I just named, I don't think you can teach intelligence. I think that that's an aptitude. Uh, And I'm not even talking about how much knowledge you have in your brain. It's how quickly can you process information. I don't believe you can teach people how to um, take responsibility. Or you can, but when they're young. <laughs> like I'm teaching my daughter right now. She's very good at abdicating it. But that's human. That's human right. nature, right? Like right. she's an animal. I mean, children are animals. Like they're basically like what they need to be doing. It's hoarding resources right. um, and taking responsibility for nothing. Right. Um, so that's that's a that's a that's a trait that that's something. You know, Adam calls it locus of control. Like, do you have an internal locus of control or external locus of control? Do you take responsibility for situations even if you don't own them Mm -hmm. or do you abdicate and uh i think that's a bias more than it is a personality trait um the other thing um the the rest i think i think the other thing is you might be thinking how can you teach curiosity or how can i think the environment we have here where it's safe to be wrong Mm -hmm. and it's safe to make mistakes Mm -hmm. safe in that It's not, we don't, and you know, people fail all the time and we're not patting each other on the back. We're saying, Hey, like, it's okay. No embarrassment here. Let's stand up and do it again. If you have that environment, then you, you can, you can drop your defenses. You can like be vulnerable to a point where being curious is okay because you don't, you're not going to be attacked or, you know, your, your position's not going to be, you know, sacked at any point. So That's one thing I really admire about the leadership team is that everybody feels like they can say, I don't know. Yeah. Let's go find the answer. We, send, we say, I'll find out. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the greatest lesson you've learned throughout your time hiring for all of these positions? I'm going to be wrong like 10% of the time. <laughs> I mean, I hate being wrong. I yeah. really do. Um, but I am. And I've, you know, not everyone I've hired is still in that position. Um and that's okay. You know, people are meant to be where they are. Uh, the The greatest lesson I've learned is also to trust myself and mm-hmm. listen. You know, when I'm conducting these interviews and I'm scoring them to to listen to what the scores and the process is telling me and not to just get immediately to like, well, I need help, yeah. you know. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, I've been so pleased with the people I, the people we have on our leadership team, I mean, it's their, our, our leadership team is unique and it's, um, and it's culture and, and the way we work together. And I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. And I don't think we would be where we are without that. So I think, you know, for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy. Okay. Two last questions. They're pretty lighthearted. What's your favorite interview question? My favorite interview question is I love, I like the, what's the biggest misperception about you? So Adam taught me that one. I like, I like to ask people to define success for me. Well, if you're successful here, what does it look like? Ta- paint that picture for me. And that I can get a really good sense of how you see yourself relative mm-hmm. to the, your team, what success means. It's just, a, I, it, it helps me understand how you think about things. Um, and then the, the, the other one I like is just, I'm a KPI person. I just want to know what people, what KPIs people want to measure. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know. I'm like, well, I don't know what we're going to talk about then. I love it. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is totally off topic. Mm-hmm. What book are you reading now and would you recommend it? I'm reading Michael Lewis's The Undoing Project, which actually is fascinating. And I would totally recommend it. I'm, you know, about 40% of the way through. By the way, I'm a huge believer. And if you don't like a book, you should stop reading it. <laughs> okay. I was reading this other one that was just horrible. And it got like really good reviews, but I'm like, every time I pick it up, I'm annoyed. So I just, you know, whatever, so life's stop. too short, stop. Yeah. Just stop reading it. Um, it's about, so it came out of his work with Moneyball. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote that. He wrote, Do you know Michael Lewis? Yeah. Okay. So um, it's about the, <laughs> frankly, it's about how impossible it is to predict human behavior based on data. Cool. And, uh, you know, what we do at Hierology here is is try to 
observe data to predict whether, you know, help, help you understand whether their, your hire is going to be a fit or not a fit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can have all the best data and all of the right signals and still be wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just think that's really fascinating. Excellent. Thanks so much, Julie. Yeah. Thanks, Kristen. That's a wrap for us this week. Thank you everyone for listening. Adam will be back next week for a new episode of the Best Team Wins podcast. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. You can find out more information about Adam and his book, The Best Team Wins, Building Your Business Through Predictive Hiring at thebestteamwins.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.